I've got a really powerful revelation uh, that I want to share with you tonight. This is something that God just gave me just in the last few weeks. And uh, so I, I think you're really going to enjoy this tonight. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a few very familiar stories in the Bible, uh, probably stories that just about everybody in this room has heard before. Uh, you probably heard it when you were in Sunday school growing up. Uh, but I'm going to show you some things about these stories that you've probably never seen before, hopefully never seen before, uh, because this is something that God revealed to me. I think it's going to be really powerful tonight. The title for the message tonight is, That Ain't the Point. <laughs> so everybody say, That Ain't the Point. That ain't the point. <laughs> See, you don't even know what you're talking about yet, but we're going to get into that. So what we're going to do, we're going to start with the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho, the walls of Jericho. How many are familiar with the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho? You probably remember hearing this story when you were in Sunday school, right? So we're going to look at a very famous verse, Joshua chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 20. It says this, so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout. What kind of shout? Great shout. Look, if you're going to shout, it may as well be a great shout. Amen. Yeah. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Now, how many are familiar with what happened here? They marched around the city once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. And the people shouted as the priests blew the trumpets and the walls fell down. And there's even been songs that have been written about this. How many have heard, uh, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came a tumbling down. You guys heard that before, all right? So yeah, everyone's familiar with this story. This was an awesome accomplishment when those walls came down, right? How many can agree that there was nothing short of a miracle that occurred when those walls came down, right? And they came down when Israel acted in obedience to God's instructions. Because God told them what to do. I want you to march around the city once a day. And then on the seventh day, I want you to march around seven times. I want you to shout. I want you to blow the trumpets. So Israel's obedience to God's instructions, that's what brought the walls down. Amen? So the falling down of those walls were an awesome miracle. How many, how many can agree with that? Here's the thing. That ain't the point. Knocking down the walls isn't the point. Well, what was the point, Pastor Heath? Well, stay with me, and we'll come back to it. Okay? In the meantime, I want to look at another story. Another very powerful story that we probably heard when we were growing up in Sunday school. How many are familiar with the story of David and Goliath? Let me see your hands. All right. You've heard of David and Goliath. Well, let's look at that story. 1 Samuel chapter 17. <clears throat> we're going to start in verse 48. So it was when the Philistine, Goliath, arose and he came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and he ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face down to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Another powerful and miraculous victory. Can we say amen to that? Here, here we have a teenage shepherd boy going up against a nine foot tall Philistine undefeated champion warrior. This kid had zero battle experience. This kid had no armor. He had no sword. He had no shield. All he had was a sling and some stones and he kills a champion warrior twice his size. Powerful, right? If anyone in their, might, in their right mind was taking bets that day, no one would have bet on David to win. This was no doubt an awesome miracle of God. Can we all agree on that? 
Now, killing Goliath was a miracle, but that ain't the point. Killing Goliath isn't the point. Well, Pastor Heath, if that ain't the point, what is the point? Keep tracking with me and we'll get to it, okay? In the meantime, I want to show you another story. Very famous Bible story. Probably another story that we learned in church when we were growing up or something that we learned in Sunday school. How many are familiar with the story of Moses and the crossing of the Red Sea? We're all familiar with that. So let's take a look at that. Exodus chapter 14. We'll start in verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground. And the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea. All of the Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Let's skip down to verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Watch this. Not so much as one of them remained. One of the most powerful miracles in the entire Bible. The entire nation of Israel. This is, this is one of Israel's most powerful experiences in their entire history. The entire nation of Israel escapes the Egyptian army by walking across the parted Red Sea on dry ground. Powerful. The Egyptian army pursued, and after Israel had crossed, Moses is instructed by God to stretch his hand over the sea, the waters returned, and the entire Egyptian army was drowned. They ought to make a movie about this. <laughs> how many of you have ever seen the Ten Commandments? <laughs> That's how awesome this miracle was. The sea actually parted. But by now, you probably know what I'm going to say. That ain't the point. <laughs> the parting of the Red Sea waters is not the point. Well, Pastor Heath, I'm getting impatient. What is the point? I'm getting there. Just hold tight. I'm going to give you one more example. How about the, the story of King Jehoshaphat and the war with the Moabites and the Ammonites? Anybody familiar with that one? So, the Moabites and the Ammonites, these were two nations that had armies. They sent both of their armies, they allied themselves together to wage war against the tribe of Judah. And so God gives King Jehoshaphat some instructions because Israel or Judah, they had caught word that the Moabites and the Ammonites were coming and, and they were gonna wage war against Judah and so they sought the Lord and the prophet of God spoke to Jehoshaphat and he gave Jehoshaphat some pretty odd sounding instructions. Here's what he said. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. And God said, listen, all of you, Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, this huge army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. The battle is not yours, right. it's God's. Amen. Judah, you're not going to have to fight. You will have to obey God's instructions. So there is a part for you to play in this, but you're not going to have to fight. God's going to fight the battle for you. So what happened? Well, we'll skip down to verse 20 and we'll find out. So they rose early in the morning and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And when Jehoshaphat had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. Notice he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. Some people are called to work in the nursery. <laughs> but some people are called to sing. He appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and they were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So what happened here? These enemies of God's people, they have allied themselves together to destroy Judah, but instead they got confused and they turned on each other and they killed each other off. Down to the very last man. Nobody escaped. They destroyed each other completely. Now just like in the case of David, which we just saw a moment ago, Judah never had to lift a sword. Right? The Bible said David didn't have a sword on him. And he still was able to defeat the enemy. These people, there was an entire army going against them. Judah never had to lift a sword. All that Judah had to do was praise God, give God praise, give God glory, give God credit, give God the thanksgiving and the recognition that he deserves. And God did the fighting for them. And turn the enemy on themselves. Now watch this. God didn't run the enemy off. God turned the enemy against themselves. Yes. And they utterly and completely destroyed one another. Yes. Yes. That's what God wants to do in your life. He doesn't want to chase the enemy off. He wants to destroy the yoke. Yes. Amen. People say all the time, well, the anointing breaks the yoke. No, the anointing does not break the yoke. The anointing destroys the yoke. That, that's, read your Bible. That's what it says. You break something, you can fix it. When it's destroyed, it's gone for good. Amen. So Judah didn't lift a sword and the entire opposing armies were defeated. But that ain't the point. <laughs> okay, I've left you in the dark long enough. So you're all wondering, if that ain't the point, what is the point? So, to explain what is the point, I want to go back to the first story. We're going to go back to the story of Jericho, the walls of Jericho. Now, before God ever gave Joshua instructions on how to take Jericho, he said these words to Joshua. Joshua chapter 6, verse 2, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, everyone say see. See. <laughs> See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. So the first thing that, jo that God says to Joshua is what? What, what? what word does he say? See. Folks, listen to me tonight. You are never going to seize it until you first see it. Faith sees what the natural eyes can't see. You're never going to be healed. If you can't see yourself healed, you've got to be able to see it. You're never going to be successful if you can't see success. You're never going to be delivered if you can't see your deliverance. You've got to see it. You've got to see your miracle. You've got to see your answer. And if you can't see your answer, then you need to renew your mind to the word of God until you can see it. That's what this thing will do. The more you dig into this, the more it will renew your mind until you can see it. So what does God say here to Joshua? He says, see, I have given the walls into your hand. Is that what he said? Did, did I read that right? See, I have given what? Jericho. Jericho into your hand. 
I've given you Jericho, its king, and the mighty men of valor. Joshua, I've given you the city. Now, had he given it to him yet? No. But faith speaks as though it's already been done. You have to see that it's already been done, and then it will be done in the natural. Amen? But he says, look, I've given you the city. I've given you the city's leadership. And I've given you the mighty men who protect it, defend it, and maintain it. I've given them into your hands. Folks, the walls weren't the point. The city was the point. The walls were a great miracle, but that wasn't the objective. Joshua, I'm giving you the city. And that's not all. But wait, there's more. Verse 20. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. We just read that verse just a few moments ago. But I didn't finish the verse. So let's finish the verse. Then the people went up into the what? City. City. Every man straight before him. And the, what did they do? They took the city. Folks, it's not enough to knock the walls down. It's quiet in here. You weren't called by God just to knock walls down. You weren't destined by God just to knock the walls down. You were called and destined by God to take the city. That's the greater victory here. Knocking the walls down is just the first step. But the real victory is taking the city. What good does it do you to knock the walls down if you're not going to take the spoils of the battle? If you're not going to take the spoils of the city. Now don't get me wrong, knocking the walls down was a miracle. Nobody can deny knocking the walls down was a miracle. But the whole point of this endeavor was to come away with the city and its riches under your control. The walls wasn't the point. The city is the point. Let's look at the story of David and Goliath. And what I want to do is I want to show you something that caught David's attention before he ever decided to fight Goliath. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to go to verse 25. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man, Goliath, who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him... The king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house, his entire family, exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Here's what you're going to get. You're going to get riches. You're going to get the king's daughter. And your family's going to be tax exempt. Goliath's threats against Israel were not David's main concern. What was David's main concern? The reward. What's the reward? What's in it for me? What do I get if I do this? Amen? Killing Goliath wasn't the point. The reward was the point. That's what motivated David to go out and do this thing. There was something in it for him. David ran towards Goliath. That's what the Bible says. He ran towards him. Why? Because he wanted that reward. I get a monetary reward. I get the king's hot daughter to be my wife. And my family's tax exempt. Man, it's worth it just for that. Does it get any better than this? Just show me the way. Leave, leave it. Where, where's he at? <laughs> Folks, we need to do away with this false piety that many Christians often engage in. They say, well, you know, I just love serving others and I just love serving the Lord and I just do it for the Lord and I don't care about what the reward is. Well, look, if God didn't want to bless you, then he wouldn't have offered you the reward. 
He wouldn't have offered you his blessing if he didn't want you to have it. So stop pretending that you're not interested in the reward. Just because dead, dry, religious tradition has told you that it's wrong to be interested in the reward. No, if it was wrong, God wouldn't have offered it to you. Amen? Every act of godliness has a reward attached to it. So stop feeling bad about accepting what God has told you over and over and over and over again that he wants you to have. It's yours. Throw your hands in the air and say, it's mine. It's mine. Amen. If God didn't want you to have it, he wouldn't have offered it. What about the story of the Red Sea? We just looked at that a moment ago. Like I said earlier, the parting of the Red Sea, that ain't the point. What is the point? The point is that Israel has a greater goal ahead of them. It's called the promised land. That's the point. That's the goal. They can't get to the promised land without the Red Sea experience. And the Red Sea experience was definitely a miracle. But the miracle doesn't stop there. Because there's a greater goal for them to achieve. All right? The Red Sea is what sealed them off from their past once and for all. Right? The Egyptian army is drowned in the sea. The Pharaoh has been utterly defeated. And the sea is closed up. So guess what? There's no turning back now. You can't go back to Egypt now. There's a big sea in front of you. You can't go back. But listen... Just because you've been totally set free from your past does not mean that you've stepped into your future yet. I really thought people would amen on that one. Just because you've been set free from what was holding you back doesn't mean that you've grabbed hold of what God has for you. Egypt was holding Israel back. They got set free from that. But they're still in the wilderness. They're set free from Egyptian slavery. They're set free from captivity. They're set free from bondage. But they're still in the wilderness. And God didn't call them to live in the wilderness. God called them to live in the promised land. So that they could uncap their, their potential. And create their own future and build their own wealth. It's great that you're no longer bound by the kingdom of darkness. But you still have a promise to grab hold of. There's still more for you to achieve in this life. Amen? I've heard addicts, they'll say things like this. Well, you know, if I can just put this bottle down, if I can just get sober, if I can just get clean, if I can just get rid of the drugs, if I can just kick this habit. Well, kicking the habit is good. Defeating drugs is good. Conquering the bottle is good. But that's not the end of the story. Because after you conquer those things, you still have a future to grab hold of after letting go of the bondage of the past. Yes, amen? amen? You, you still have a kingdom purpose to fulfill. The parting of the Red Sea ain't the point. The promised land is the point. The promised land is the goal. Amen? After you conquer the bondage, after you conquer the addiction, after you conquer the life controlling issue, now you have the awesome privilege of embarking on the journey that fulfills your kingdom purpose. It's great that you conquered drinking. It's great that you conquered drugs. It's great that you left that abusive relationship. But what about the abundant life that God has waiting for you? That's what he wants for you. Amen? See, that's what it means to be more than a conqueror. Israel became conquerors when they defeated Egypt at the Red Sea. They conquered Egypt. They became more than conquerors when they reclaimed the promised land that God wanted them to have. That was the goal. What about the story of Jehoshaphat? And the armies of Moab and Ammon. What about that story? What was the point there? Well, to find that out, let's read what happened immediately after that battle. Right after Moab and Ammon killed each other off. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We'll start in verse 24. 
It says, so when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, the army, and there were dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. Man, that's powerful. Two entire armies have been completely wiped out, and Israel, Judah, didn't even have to lift a sword. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. Now let me ask you something. I want you to think about this for a moment. These two armies waged war against Judah. How does it benefit Judah that they defeated the enemy? And the answer is this. It doesn't benefit them at all. If all they did was defeat the enemy, then they walk away in the same state that they were in before the enemy decided to attack them. Judah was just minding their own business. Judah's just living their life. They're doing their thing. And then all of a sudden, Moab and Ammon decide, well, we're going to wage war against you. So if all they do is fend off the attack from the enemy, that doesn't benefit them. It just means that they get to live the same life that they lived before the enemy decided to attack them. However, if Judah walks away with the spoils of that battle, now it's been worth their while. Now it's benefited them. Right? If you're sitting on your couch on a Sunday afternoon, you're watching a football game, just sitting there drinking a Coke, having a good time, and your neighbor comes over to your house and bangs on the door, and you open up the door, and your neighbor decides he wants to beat the snot out of you. And so instead of letting him beat the snot out of you, you beat the snot out of him and leave him bleeding in your front yard and you go back and watch your game, how did that benefit you? It didn't benefit you at all. All it did was cost you a couple of plays that you couldn't see on the game. But after you beat the guy up and you take a $50 bill out of his pocket and walk back in your house, now you've been benefited. Don't go beating up people and taking $50 bills from them. I'm just using that as an, as an example, okay? The spoils of the battle, that's what they were after. That, that's, that's, that's what benefited them. Amen? Amen? Judah's defeat of the enemy armies wasn't the point. The spoils were the point. I'm going to give you some closing thoughts about what the real point is. Now, we talked about this a lot last year. Uh, we had a whole vision casting thing last year about Jesus building his church. There's a, there's a verse in the Bible where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hell's gates will not prevail against the church. That's what Jesus said. Now, he didn't say any church. He said the church I build. We got to let Jesus build his church. Amen. But Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against my church. Now, let me ask you something. We've talked about this before. Is a gate, it says the gates of hell will not prevail. Is a gate an offensive or defensive structure? In other words, uh, do you attack somebody with a gate or do you defend with a gate? It's, it's defensive, right? You don't go around throwing gates at people, right? Gates are not offensive. Gates are defensive. So what he's saying here is hell's defenses are not going to be adequate against the church's offense. Hell will not be able to defend itself against the offensive attack of the church. But let me ask you, how do most Christians behave concerning spiritual warfare. Most Christians look at spiritual warfare from a defensive posture. Well, I thank God that I have the victory whenever the enemy attacks me. Honey, that ain't the point. 
Amen? The real point is not that you can withstand the enemy. The real point is that the enemy doesn't stand a chance when you bring the fight to the enemy. Amen. We're not supposed to be on the defense. We're supposed to be on the offense storming the gates of hell. We're supposed to be on the offense retaking territory for the kingdom of God. We're supposed to be taking back what the enemy has stolen from us. You can tell I'm a little worked up tonight. Because I really wanted to start our Bread for the Fight series. <laughs> but we're going to have to postpone that for a few weeks. How many have uh, started to read our book, by the way? Okay. We're, we're going to be covering it in just a few weeks. Folks, you are Bread for the Fight. But you are not just bred for a defensive fight. You are also bred for an offensive fight. You are bred to bring the fight to the enemy. Now, listen to me. Our enemy is not people. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is the principalities and powers and the rulers of spiritual wickedness in high places. But their defenses will not stand against the church that Jesus built. So stop looking at spiritual warfare from a defensive perspective all the time. You're not supposed to be on the defense. You're supposed to be on the offense. Yes. And you're more than a conqueror. Yes. One last scripture. John chapter 10 verse 10. It says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That is Satan's only design for your life. Is to steal from you to kill and to destroy the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly now watch this this is very important Jesus does not say I have come to help deliver you when the enemy is stealing killing and destroying he doesn't say that does he he says, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but after you've defeated the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, there's abundant life after the deliverance. First, you've got to get set free from the thief who's stealing, killing, and destroying. But after you've been set free from that, after you've been set free, there's an abundant life waiting for you to grab hold of. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But we already know he's defeated. But after he's defeated, you've got an abundant life waiting for you. Amen. Deliverance from the enemy who steals, kills, and destroys isn't the point. Abundant life is the point. Well, Pastor Heath, I just hope that I can make it through the enemy's attack this week. No, honey, that ain't the point. Abundant life is your kingdom... Is your, it, abundant life in your kingdom walk. Abundant life in your kingdom purpose. That's the point for your life. Abundance is, your, is the point. Amen. Knocking down the walls isn't the point. Getting the spoils of the battle, that's the point. Taking the city is the point. Killing the giant isn't the point. Reaping the rewards, that's the point. Amen? Drowning the Pharaoh's army in the sea, that's not the point. The point is you got a promised land to go in and get. And what happened when they got to the promised land? We find out that seven of the 12 tribes, they wouldn't go into the promised land. They were standing outside. And Joshua said, and the King James, he says, how long will you be slack? How long are you gonna be a slacker? Why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? There's a whole beautiful promised land waiting for you to go in there and take a hold of it. It's yours. God gave it to you. Go in and conquer it. Defeating the, the armies of Moab and Ammon. That's not the point. Grabbing the spoils of the battle. That's the point. Amen? You've got a greater victory laying ahead for you. Amen? I mean, I'm glad that we've been set free of the bondage of the past. I'm, I'm thankful for it. But just because I've conquered my past doesn't mean that I've grabbed hold of my future. Amen? Amen. When you grab hold of a future, that's when you're more than a conqueror. Amen. You haven't just conquered the past. 
you grab hold of what God has for you. Did that encourage anybody's faith tonight? Good. Give God praise for it. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, we know that you'd like it even more to visit us in person at Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida. To learn more about our church or to support our ministry financially, visit us online at flwc.info. If you enjoyed this video, you probably ought to subscribe to our channel. Absolutely, so watch another video and subscribe to our channel. Or subscribe to our channel and then watch another video. Either way, we pray God's blessings on you as you dig into God's word and learn how his kingdom works. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.